All right, well, as Andrea alluded to, we are going to dive into John chapter 7 here. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were there, and Jesus was kind of seemed to be vacillating about whether he was going up to this uh, festival of tabernacles, of booths, but he does make it. And then uh, we're going to pick up the, the story in verse 25. But before we get there, I want to ask you a question this morning. Uh, so my question is this. What is the hardest thing, or maybe... Yeah, the hardest thing you've ever had to learn, like took you the most effort or time or you had to try several times. See a hand over here. Well, yep. Um, reading. Reading. Yes, that's a tough one. Leland. Uh, figuring out how to play all the really old game systems. Okay, yes, those old video game systems. Yeah, you. that takes some learning. Sophia. Public speaking? <laughs> yes, that's that is a tricky trick on the trampoline, I assume. We hope. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Rylan. Learning how to skate. Learning how to skate, yes. Okay, let's go to the back here. Bill. Learning how not to try and control people and circumstances. <laughs> yeah, how's that, how's that going? Yeah, exactly. Brian. <laughs> Just being an adult. So many, yes. I do not talk to like Yes, yes, it's painful. <laughs> and parenting, yeah, that's another one. Okay, last one, Ryda. Then I have a new question. What's, a, what's something that's hard to, was hard for you to learn? Uh, basketball. Basketball, that is a tough one. Okay, let me change the question a little bit. Have you ever had to unlearn something? Learn not to do something? And was that hard? Fighting. Fighting, yes. That's a hard habit to, to break for sure. Anyone else? Something that was hard to unlearn? Bill? Managing my future. <laughs> okay, there you go. Yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> What's the verse that, you know, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, but we kind of, we like to say that one in first person, right? Yeah. Evan. Oh, yes. Yeah, getting rid of earworms. That's that's tricky. One more, AJ. Your last one. Um, can I not use much candy? Oh, yes. Yeah, let me know when you figure out the secret to that one, because some of us haven't gone there. Okay, Leland. Actual last one. Actual last one. Um, yelling. Yelling. Yes. It's a future one. It's a f okay. It's, it's aspirational. Okay. Yeah. I think that's. I think sometimes unlearning something is almost harder in a lot of ways, right? Um, I've. I've. I think gone through three distinct phases in my life of learning to play the drums, and the second two were definitely the hardest because I had to. I would. With those ones, I was unlearning what I had previously learned. Um, I, I took lessons as a kid. I remember my mom, my, my poor brother had to learn accordion, piano, and trombone. And then when they got to me, uh, they said, what instrument do you want to learn? Because that was all the instruments my mom wanted my brother to learn. Um, but I learned, so I, I took lessons as a kid, and, and we would, I would play together with some of the other music students, but it was like, it was quite limited. And so then when I started playing and as a teenager at my church, I kind of had to relearn drumming. I had to unlearn some of the things I, I thought I knew, and I had to learn new things so that I could play with other people. It was kind of like starting over. Um, and then my third one was um, we moved to Edmonton and Tabitha joined a bagpipe band. And I was told if I wanted to see my wife in the summer, I should probably just join the band myself. So I took that advice, but I decided, oh, I'll take up a uh, marching drum. Uh, but that was another situation of uh, really starting over. My fir I went and took lessons again for the first time in like a dozen years. And our first lesson, the guy literally just got me to hold the sticks properly and play really, like, literally, like, tap, 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 
tap. So it was, it was starting over again. It was unlearning what I previously learned, and that was probably the hardest part. Why I bring all that up is we kind of get to a section of scripture where Jesus is telling us there's times in our walk with Christ where we have to forget what we know, think we know. We have to unlearn all the answers that we think we've come up with in life, and we need to do the hard work of rediscovering who Jesus is. And that really encapsulates well, I think, this encounter that Jesus has in count, series of encounters that Jesus has at the uh, Festival of Tabernacles. So we're going to pick up at verse 25, and I want to read, uh, we're going to read right to the end of the chapter eventually, but we'll just kind of bite off the first eight verses here together. It says, at that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, isn't this the man they're trying to kill? Here he is speaking publicly, and they are not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Messiah? But we know where this man is from, and when the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. I am not f here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him, because I am from him, and he sent me. At this, they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. So many in the crowd believed in him. They said, when the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man? And the Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. So the, the first sort of mo movement here from the crowd is like they're trying to square Jesus with what they figure they have already figured out about God uh, at this point, about the Messiah. You know, how does Jesus fit their expectations of what the Messiah will do? They, they say that the Messiah, their understanding of the Messiah is that he's supposed to be steeped in mystery somehow. They're not, he's supposed to be a human being, but they're, they're, he's kind of supposed to be a, this bolt uh, up from the blue, right? They don't know where he comes from. And so Jesus kind of turns their expectations on their head. They say, yes, he says, yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. And you read that all throughout the Gospels. is like, you know, that's a common problem that people have with Jesus. It's like, well, isn't this Mary's son? Like, isn't this Mary and Joseph's kid that we saw grow up in Nazareth? Um, the, the familiarity with Jesus makes it an obstacle to, to con conceiving that he might also be the Messiah, the Son of God. And so Jesus starts connecting the dots for them. He says, I'm not here on my own authority, but he who sent me, that is God the Father, is true. Now, that's kind of a weird turn of phrase for us. Um, an another way of translating might be saying, but he who sent me is real, which kind of help, at least helps me out a bit. He says, you do not know him, but I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. Jesus is saying, I think sometimes our, our knowledge is based on what we think is true. You know, they, they've developed a theology in their day of, of who the Messiah is supposed to be, and Jesus doesn't quite fit that mold somehow. But Jesus is saying, well, no, what I am comes directly from God. Like, God has sent me. And f for all your sort of theological constructs and ideas about who Jesus is supposed to be, he's the actual thing. You know, he's not, he's not playing at God talk here or, or building castles in the sky. Jesus is the real deal. And it's, I think, maybe easy to read back into the Gospels and say, okay, yeah, they, they had expectations that were off of Jesus, but we don't do that today, right? Like that's, you know, our basis for knowing is, is so much stronger, and yet we... I think, often fall into the same trap. I was thinking of, uh, you know, just ask, thinking, what is the basis for our knowing things, right? Often, our basis is really thin. We hear something somewhere, and we just assume it to be true without really investigating ourselves or considering sometimes the source that we're told uh, things. So I, I looked up a, a few this week. Who, this little trivia quiz. Who invented peanut butter? 
famous American, not by the name of Skippy, unfortunately, or Squirrel. Um, so, so some of you have probably read of a, a Christian fellow that is supposed to be, <laughs> Tabitha knows the answers, but she's not going to say. George Washington Carver is usually the, the typical answer. But if you actually go back, the first sort of like peanut butter-like product that has a patent in the US comes much earlier from John Kellogg, which I didn't know. And I, but I always thought, yeah, it was, it was George, I always thought it was George Washington Carver. But I was wrong on that one. Um, I was also reading this week chalk outlines in crime scenes, even in like the 30s and 40s and 50s, were exceptionally rarely used uh, for a number of good reasons we don't get to need, need to get into. But I always thought they were super common, right? Because you watch crime shows and they're always outlining the bodies in chalk. Well, maybe that wasn't the greatest source of knowledge on, on criminology, was watching it on TV, right? Here's a, here's a Bible one, actually, right from the Gospels. The, we three kings of Orient are, who are we talking about? Who's that song about? The, the Magi, I think I heard. But, and this is maybe a, a more obvious one. If you actually read the account in Matthew, uh, or in Luke, I should say. I guess they're in Matthew and Luke. Uh, we're not told that there's three of them. We're to not told that they're kings. We're not told that they're ca riding on camels, but this is a, all things that we immediately picture, right? Because it's in the song. Well, the song, as songs do, took some artistic liberties, right? But we, we have a tendency to picture things a certain way just because somebody maybe tells us that or we hear it somewhere once, right? And, and Jesus, I think, is kind of in the same boat with the authorities in Jerusalem saying, hey, you know, you have this whole thing built up about who I'm supposed to be, but I'm, God is for real and he has really sent me and that might not fit all of your stereotypes and depictions. So, so I think Jesus' first move is just to kind of help us open our minds in, in this episode here to say, you know, Jesus, the Messiah has come and we have to accept him for who he is. He says, yes, you know me. And you know where I am from. I'm not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him because I am from him and he sent me. And sometimes I think, especially as longtime followers of Christ, we, you know, are on the receiving end of a lot of good teaching. But sometimes I maybe goes to our, our heads a little bit, doesn't it? And, and we start to think, well, we've got this God thing figured out. Right? We've got this church thing all buttoned up. And, and I think we all kind of need to take a moment at different times and say, come back to the basics and say, Lord, what are you really saying? Jesus, who are you really? Because Jesus introduces more mystery for us in this story even. Uh, picking up again at verse 33, Jesus said, I am with you for only a short time now, and then I'm going to the one who sent me, going back to the Father. You will look for me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. Now the Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? Will he go where our people live scattered among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What did he mean when he said, you will look for me, but you will not find me? And where I am, you cannot come. They're, they're imagining that Jesus is talking about immigration, you know, to a different part of the Roman Empire where Jews maybe aren't welcome or, or particularly present. Uh, they're kind of mystified this, by this. And I think John gets a kick out of including these things, right? Is that for everything that Jesus' statement that he seems to make that we, you know, viewing in the rear view mirror, it's perfectly 2020. He's talking about his death. He's talking about ascending to his father in heaven. The Jews are thinking he's talking about a road trip. <laughs> thinking he's, you know, going to go, go uh, have a Mediterranean holiday. Um, and so it's just furthering this idea that, you know, that even in the bit that they seem to think they know, Jesus mystifies them in that. And, and sometimes we're uncomfortable with that ourselves, aren't we? You know, that we get an answer to a question from Jesus, but sometimes it raises two more. You know, and that we are mystified by what Jesus is even doing in our lives sometimes. And yet I think 
what John doesn't, one of the reasons I love the book of John is that he, I think he's raising this expectation that there's more to discover about Jesus. He's raising this expectation that if we are going to be followers of Jesus, we need to, above all things, be curious about God. We need to be pursuing him and loving him and finding out more about him. And, and the whole book of John is just this glorious invitation to do exactly that. So Jesus says, I, you know, I come from the Father who is real. I'm going to the Father, and that's maybe a bit of a mystery to you. But then he reveals himself quite well. And we talked earlier in the kids' portion about the, you know, the significance of Jesus revealing himself at the Festival of Booths. Let's read the portion here, um, exactly what he says in verse, beginning at verse 37. It says, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. It's almost a precise quote, actually, from Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not yet been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is a, the prophet. Others said, He is the Messiah. So others asked, How can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not Scripture say that ma the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Again, they're, they're sort of mystified because they're trying to line him up with, with what they seem to know of the Messiah. And this bit is, is accurate, actually, you know, that we find out actually Jesus was born in Bethlehem. That is his pedigree. But I, I was researching this week, and, and I, you know, I ran across a really good description, I think, of, um, of the, the water ceremony at the Festival of uh, Booths. Um, Andrea described it well for us, so I won't give all the deal, details there, but um, I thought this, this probably was better stated than my synopsis of it, so just let me read it for you. Uh, this is from uh, D.A. Carson's um, commentary on, on uh, the Gospel of John. He says, on the seven days of the feast, so this is you know, a week-long festival, and on every single day of the feast, they would fill up a golden uh, pitcher uh, with water from this pool of Siloam that uh, Andrea mentioned, and then it would be carried in a procession, led by the high priest, back to the temple. So the temple is up on a hill, so as they get to the top and approach the gate to the south side of the inner court, uh, there would be three blasts from the sopar, which is uh, a trumpet that was played in celebration in the temple. And so while the pilgrims watched, so of course people would come from outside Jerusalem to, to be a part of the festival, as they watched, the priests would process around the altar with this golden pitcher, and the temple choir would sing the halal, which was uh, three, sorry, five psalms from uh, Psalm 113 to Psalm 118, and they would sing these as they walked around. Uh, there's, a, there's a fun little bit of uh, scripture memory thrown in there. So when the qu choir reached the end, Psalm 118, every single male pilgrim that was present was supposed to have two things. They would have a branch of uh, willows and hyssops, uh, all wrapped around with a palm uh, frond to kind of hold it together. And they would shake that to, as kind of a noisemaker. And then the other thing they would hold up in their other hand was a lemon, which kind of seems random to us, but it was kind of a symbol of the harvest there. And if you live in a place like Israel, uh, you're warm enough to be able to grow citrus fruits, which is you know something we kind of would just dream about here. But the other thing that you really need to grow citrus is you need heat, but you also need water. That's why Florida is such a hotbed of citrus growing, is it's a swamp. They get a lot of rainfall there, and you need a lot of water to grow citrus. But Okay, I'm getting off on a geography lesson, but the promised land is not, is not a swamp. It's not like Florida. It's actually quite dry. And so if you have fruit like that, it means God has sent rain. And that's really what they're celebrating in this, part of what they're celebrating in this water uh, festival is the fact that God has sent them rain. So they'd hold up their things and everybody would cry out, give thanks to the Lord three times. 
Uh, then the water would be offered to God at that time of the morning sacrifice along with uh, the, the daily drink offering. So they would pour the um, from the golden pitcher, they, there would be silver bowls set up at the altar. And then from the bowl, bowls, the water would be poured onto the altar itself. So these ceremonies um, were related in Jewish thought both to the Lord's provision of water in the desert, as we talked about. It was also having to do with salvation, of course, anything linked to wandering the desert necessarily had to be linked to crossing the Red Sea. But it would also was also like a foreshadowing of what they were anticipating, which was the pouring out of God's spirit on his people in the last days. So pouring at the Feast of Tabernacles refers symbolically to the Messianic age in which a stream from the sacred rock would flow over the whole earth. And so this is part of the symbolism, too, of what Jesus is getting at. You know, he says, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. It's very specifically saying, I'm fulfilling these hopes that you have as you celebrate the um, festival of tabernacles. What's interesting to me in all of it is that it's the celebration, the Feast of Tabernacles is is laid out, as Andrea said, in the book of Leviticus. What's interesting to me is that this water ceremony is extra biblical. It's certainly been around, by the time of Jesus, it's been around for a couple centuries. It's been something that's been well thought out and they've incorporated scripture and the singing of scripture into it. Um, but it is sort of a man-made tradition, which Jesus has a habit of really railing against, doesn't he? And yet in this case, he, he says, no, actually, this is, this is pointing to me. You know, come to me if you're thirsty. If you if you're feel like you lived in a dry and parched land, come to me. And even in this way that, that they're looking at uh, something that it isn't maybe commanded in Scripture, and yet it's a way of them expressing a longing for God, says, Jesus says, even that is fulfilled in me. And I think sometimes we have those experiences in life, don't we? You know, we, we, as longtime followers of Christ, we get the spiritual disciplines, or at least try to practice them. We're, we're here at church week in and week out. And sometimes we still maybe feel like there, it, there's an itch that isn't being scratched somehow, spiritually. And there's maybe something missing still. We, we start to look around for it. And yet, I think Jesus, very eloquently, by standing up in the middle of this ritual, it says, if there's something even beyond what is commanded in Scripture that you feel is missing, he says, you can find that in me. What is missing for us in Jesus Christ is nothing. He is the fulfillment of every good thing that we could possibly ever want. I, I so enjoyed you know, the last few conversations I had with uh, Andrea Postin, you know, that was a topic that came up for us is, you know, we, you know, somewhat, somewhat tongue in cheek, you know, talked about will there be horses in heaven? That was, that was close to her heart. Um, but, you know, she, she, she described it this way as somebody related to her of that, that if it is a good thing, you know, if it's something that we is a longing that God has placed in our heart, then he will fo fulfill that longing that he's placed there. That being in his presence will somehow fulfill that thing. And so we kind of, from that, adduce that, yeah, there's pro she figured there, pro there had to be horses in heaven in, the, <laughs> in that case. Um, but it, it gets me to that question myself, right? You know, and we can go through our days and our weeks and our years even and sometimes feel like something is missing. And we start going somewhere else for it. And sometimes it's even just a, a narrative that we tell ourselves. I'm, I'm in this um, very slow process of trying to lose a little weight. And one of my killers is I get everybody to bed, and then I like to have a snack, which is a really bad way to lose weight. Um, but one of the th things I realized I had to do is just start telling myself, I actually don't need this thing right now. If I feel like I, I'm stressed out or whatever, I can go to the Lord instead. You know, for I, I actually, you know, whatever, a chocolate bar or whatever I'm, I think I'm craving, that can be met some other way. And that's, that's 
part of the walk of faith, I think, not just in dieting, but in many respects, is as much as I think I need to go somewhere else for what I need, it can be found in Jesus Christ. John doesn't end the chapter there, though, so let's finish it up, because he's, he's got one little twist, um, of course, for the powers that be here. Picking up in verse 35, he says, Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees, who asked them, Why didn't you bring him in? So the temple guards have been stati- standing at the sidelines while Jesus has been preaching, declaring that he is the living water, and the guards come back empty-handed. He says, The guards say, No one ever spoke the way this man does. You mean he's deceived you also, the Pharisees retorted. Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed in him? No. But this mob that knows nothing of the law, there's a curse on them. Now Nicodemus, who we met in chapter 3, Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? And they replied, Are you from Galilee too? Look into it, and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. So the, the reason that the um, chief priests and the Pharisees miss what's going on with Jesus is they're so locked into we know who Jesus is supposed to be. And, and they miss that. And that's a theme, of course, throughout all of the... Uh, Gospels is that they just don't have the humility to say, actually, we might know less than we think we do. And so because of that, the ruling authorities of Jesus Day miss out on who he is. But it seems to be revealed to the mob, as they describe uh, the people that have gathered for the festival. It's, it's, it's kind of a derogatory word for a bunch of religious pilgrims, actually, right? Like, these are people that are vested enough in their walk with God that they are going to leave their jobs and their livelihoods for a week or more, depending on travel time, and come to Jerusalem just for a week-long religious observance. And, and so it's, you know, the priests are saying, oh, these people, they don't know anything, but they seem to know enough to get that something is going on bigger here. And this, this uh, ties in nicely. You know, this is a, a theme that John will develop at great length throughout the gospel, but it comes up actually in Paul's writing too. And I wanted to just, I think he puts it so eloquently, I wanted to end there this morning f- from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? As we've just been reading about. Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand a sign. We read about that this morning. And Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Skipping ahead, he, in chapter 2, says, We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age, or of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden, And then God is destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him, these are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. And so we recognize that 
We have to put aside some of our human reasoning sometimes about who Jesus is and what he's going to do in our lives. We have to fit our expectations to the foolishness of the spirit, the wisdom of the gospel. You know, for all the, the theology that had been built up by Jesus' day about who the Messiah was supposed to be, who Jesus really is, I think a lot of people would have been a lot wiser to say, actually, I don't know. I don't know. But Jesus tells us he came from the Father. He's the one to ask. And so if people are asking us about Christ, I think we could be humble enough to say sometimes, I don't know, but I know who to ask. Let's take a moment and pray. Lord, we do come to you this morning, and we want to know you better. Lord, and we admit that, um, that as we seek to renew our minds by Scripture uh, that, and by your Holy Spirit, that necessarily means letting go of um, times and thoughts and ideas that turn out to be wrong. Lord, and we just pray you'd forgive us when we've persisted in our faults, persisted in our mistakes, Lord. We pray that you would give us fresh eyes to see you clearly, to see where you're leading us, to come to you for living water, Lord. And sometimes we overcomplicate things. Sometimes we go to other sources for sustenance, for being sustained, for salvation, Lord. Give us um, eyes to see that you're the only true source of water. You're the only pure source that can really satisfy. Thank you for this morning, this time to turn our thoughts to you, to reflect, and then to intentionally move toward you, Lord. We pray that you would likewise move toward us. In Jesus' name, amen.